to get through it, but it's well worth it. So I highly recommend it that you, if you're really into understanding the new Bible movement in this country, this book will really open your eyes up. So anyway, um, we're going to continue on, uh, recap from the last lesson, uh, the degeneration principle. Sin not only has a degenerative effect on the flesh and the mind, but it degenerates the totality of the man, both body, soul, and spirit. Sin perpetuates more sin, darkness perpetuates more darkness, wickedness, evil, etc., etc. Iniquity has a cumulative effect, not only on the individual, but on society as a whole, in fact, the whole nation, uh, and the world in the end. We know that the whole world had a cumulative effect right before the flood, didn't it? <laughs> it said the whole world was, was steeped in this stuff. And guess what? As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days to come in some men. So there's going to be a repeat. The whole world is going to be given over to wickedness. And so uh, it has a cumulative effect. In fact, sin contaminates everything it touches until there is no remedy but divine judgment. And we said that in Genesis 6, 5, where it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, see, sin begins in the heart, was only evil continually. And that's something. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. So, Let's get into talking about uh, the form of godliness. Now, this is going to uh, segue into end times prophecy a little bit, talk about false prophets and how the devil's ministers had the appearance of righteousness while inwardly the sin is manifest. And the way that you can tell the false prophets and the false ministers of Satan is look at their fruits, look at their works. Don't listen to their words. Look at the fruits of what they do. That's the primary way to understand and, uh, and identify false prophets. Okay? So let's look at a case study of the Pharisees. So let's note, first of all, the hypocrisy of the, of the Pharisees. Can anybody here give me a definition of hypocrisy? All right? Anybody? Hypocrisy? All right? Yeah? One of those things you know what it is, but how do you, how do you word the definition? Okay. Well, you, one way living, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, see, I always say a perfect example of hypocrisy is a politician. Because <laughs> 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 they'll say one thing to one guy and they'll say something totally different to the other, and they all want one thing get me my vote, <laughs> you know. So that's, I mean, I, I'm being facetious. But the thing is, is, is really, it's, it's, it's putting on a front of something that you're not, basically speaking. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were not righteous in them, even though they thought they were, but they weren't. And Jesus Christ made that abundantly clear. And not only did he make it abundantly clear, but in the end, their fruits manifested. And their fruit manifested, the fruits of their heart manifested in what? Murdering the Son of God. That's what they did. And they were murderers. I mean, they said, how are we going to kill him? They didn't say, let's listen to him. No. No, they wanted to kill him. Guess what? They wanted to kill Paul too, didn't they? And and guess what? They wanted to kill Lazarus because because of Lazarus being raised from the dead, many of them believed. It's like their remedy for something that they didn't like was just kill them. <laughs> so they're murderers. And what did Jesus Christ say? The year of your father the devil and the lust of your father we, you will do. He was a what? Murderer. Murderer from the beginning. You see that? So so you so you see their fruits display what's really in their heart. So, uh, no hypocrisy of the Pharisees in that they appear outwardly to be godly, having a form. That's a, that's a word we're going to explore here in a second. A form of godliness, but inwardly, they are full of wickedness. God looks upon the heart of the man, not the outward appearance. And so, one of the deceptions that, the, that Satan is so good at doing is he makes everything full of glitter and gold and the outward image you know, if you, you, I always pick on Hollywood because I despise it. But the thing is, as you look at Hollywood, what's the image? You see, what's my image look like? And then you go into digging into some of these so-called stars' lives and their, their debauchery to some stuff. I mean, at least the rock stars, they, they admit they're, they're uh, immoral. But some of these people, you know, you, you listen to some of the stuff that they, they do and you just you stunned, you know? And they, they have that outward appearance of godliness and, um, and all that. And so anyway, so that's 
that's that's what we're talking about here. It's an outward appearance. John 18, 28 says this, Then led they Jesus from uh, Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. Okay, now who was Caiaphas? He was the high priest, right? And and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled. And here they are. They got a kangaroo court. They got trumped up charges. They paid false witnesses to lie, okay? <laughs> you know, to kill a man that has not done anything wrong, all right? They don't want to be defiled. Huh? Exactly, and they don't want to be defiled. You see, so that, that's a perfect example of that holier-than-thou attitude, but at the same time, inwardly, they are ravening and full of wickedness, right? All right, so it says so they should might, that they might eat the Passover. So Matthew 23, 27 says this, and this is Christ exposing the heart of these, of these people, okay? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, there it is, it's an outward appearance, but are within full of dead man's bones, and of all uncleanness. Basically, you're talking decomposing dead bodies. That's that's what God compared the heart of those uh, Pharisees to. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. See that? So, so, so look not on the outward appearance. Now look at Luke 11, what he says. And this is the same thing, but from a perspective of Luke, the position. Look what he says. It say, ravening and wickedness. That's what it says. It says in, in Matthew, it's 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 a uh, uh, dead man's bones, uncleanness, and then Luke says ravening and wickedness. Look at that word ravening, or ravening, ravening, however you pronounce it. It's act of plundering, robbery, extortion, and that's something. So one of the things that that, that we know about um, the Pharisees is they were covetous. It was all about robbing widows' houses. Jesus Christ is pointing it out. Guess what is going on in this country in these last days? The exact same thing. False prophets standing up there preaching and saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, all the while they're fleecing the flock. That's what's going on. See, the thing hasn't changed any. What goes on then is still going on now. It's nothing different, okay? The love of money is what? The root of all evil. You see that? And so it's by covetousness that these false prophets in the last days are going to deceive many. That's what this prosperity gospel foolishness is going on. It's been going on since the 1960s, probably beyond that. And that God promises you wealth and power and all that stuff if you'll just give, 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 you know? Some of that stuff. Anyway, and so it's an act of robbery and plundering. This very condition will define the religious leaders of the last days before the Antichrist comes into power. And principally speaking of covetousness, now, 2 Peter 2 is that, is that uh, chapter that's talking about uh, the, 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 the false prophets of the last days. There's another uh, uh, rundown on it in the book of Jude. In 2 Peter 2, 3, it says this, And through covetousness shall they with feign words make merchandise of you. You see that? And that's that whole chapter is talking about these false prophets in the last days. So like the Pharisees were outwardly appeared righteous and godly, but inwardly they were covetous. They were doing it for the money, right? And the same situation going on with the false prophets in the last days, okay? These TV celebrity preachers, folks, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. What is the fruit of their doings? And that's how you, how you, how you identify, okay? And so, and then of course, uh, Luke uh, 16, 4, it, it talks about uh, the same thing with the, uh, with the Pharisees there. Luke 16, 4 says, uh, um, let's see, 16, 4, 14, 16, 14 says, And the Pharisees uh, also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. So, see, the Pharisees themselves were also loves money. Now, one of the things you say, is, think about this. The high priest, it says they took, they took him to the palace of the high priest. <laughs> Palace, get that, folks? The high priest was living in a palace. You see, these people were in league with the Roman government, right? They were good buddy buddies with the Roman government. Roman government said, look, you keep these people under control, and we'll take care of you. You'll get all the riches and the good things. And what did they say? This man is going to mess the whole world up around here, and the Romans will come and take away our nation and our place. See what they were concerned about? They were concerned about their status. They were concerned about 
about their houses and their and all their stuff. You see that I mean? And so it's all about the money, right? And so that's what we uh, says right here, Second Timothy uh, three three five, having a form of godliness. So they had that outward appearance. Look what it says here. Uh, it's an appearance, a mere form and semblance of the real thing. See that? And so quite naturally, you know, when John the Baptist shows up, they don't want anything to do with him. And when Jesus shows up and starts exposing them, then it gets real bad. Because you see, what they're thinking is, I'm about to lose my station in this life. I'm going to lose everything. If this cat keeps going, the Romans are going to come in here and they're going to, they're going to uh, put this place under control of Roman authority and take away my power. And so there you go. They, they were worried about what men thought about them. They were worried about their station in life. All right, so let's take a look at conscience. All right. Sin will also destroy a man's conscience. One of the things that we talked about, I think Brother Lee and Brother Dave both were talking about this, uh, we were born with an innate sense of right and wrong, right? And what we call that is we call it a conscience, okay? And, and that's, a, that's a really shallow definition of what conscience is. I'm not going to go real deep into it. You know what it means. All right, sin will also destroy a man's conscience. The, the word used in the King James is sear as with a hot iron. Look at that. See, it's a searing of the conscience. <laughs> and you say, well, what does that mean? You know, it, it means a, a sinner is born with an innate sense of right and wrong called a conscience, but the more he ignores his conscience, the harder he gets until he can no longer feel. He can no longer discern good and evil. So what happens is what sin does, sin is like a hot iron. The more that iron hits that conscience and the more that sinner gives into that sin, the more that conscience gets smaller, smaller, weaker, 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 to the point where they're doing something they never thought they'd ever do in their lives. There are many a sinner that come to the end of themselves, and I've, I've heard the testimonies, and they'd say, I never thought I'd be here. That's what sin will do. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go and cause you to stay longer than you wanted to stay and in the end, it'll cause you to pay more than you were willing to pay, right? And so what we have here now, 1 Timothy 4, 1 says this, how now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall be, some, some shall depart from the faith. Now that right there, basically you can say apostasy, all right? Giving heed to seducing spirits. Now there's a spiritual component to this. There's a demonic element teaching spirits that are going to come out in the last days, teaching false doctrine and lead many astray, away from truth, right? That's what's going on now. Uh, and doctrines of devils. So these things are invented by the hell. This is, this is hellish stuff. And this whole country is proliferated with all kinds of cults, okay? We name them all, you know, Jehovah's Mormons, uh, Joseph's Witness Mormons, and then you can just go on down the line. All of them call themselves Christians and all of them claim Jesus Christ and, and they're wrong. <laughs> they're not the Christ that we know in this book here. All right? And so uh, uh, verse 2 says this, speaking lies in hypocrisy. So not only are they hypocrites in their actions, but they're speaking the lies. See? So it's a, it says this here, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Look what that says. <laughs> it says to cauterize. Look at that to cauterize, to render insensitive. That means they can't feel the pain of sin anymore. They can't feel the pain of guilt anymore. They can't feel the burden of sinning against Almighty God. They can't feel it anymore. Yes, sir. Uh, expand a little bit on the uh, phrase Oh, departing from the faith. They depart from the faith. What did it say? It says that it's, they have a form of godliness and that these people, I look at it like this, and, and I've read the commentaries on it and things like that. It's like uh, John, in 1 John, he says, they were not all of us. They were not all of us, even though they were among us. And I think that these are the, the professors, right? But they're not the real deal. It's kind of Yeah. Uh, 
Well, there's plenty of people sitting in Baptist churches that do all the right things and say all the right things. Some of them have been sitting on a preacher for 30 years and they're just as lost as a goose in a sunstorm. You know? You know, I don't hear it say the party from the religion. I swear to party. Uh, right. But faith to me means that it's a real thing. Yeah, well, look at your context here. He's, you know, if faith can mean the religion of Christ. I guess you could say that. Yeah, I see what you're saying, brother. I see what you're saying. And so, so yeah, so so this is basically uh, uh, what happens is, is is the conscience gets seared, and then they begin to depart from that that, that is godly, that is that is righteous, that that is truth. Basically, we're going to look at that here in a minute, talking about truth. How truth is rendered completely void when these people get to this point. Right. So look at Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. And that's critical. An understanding, this darkening of the, it's a searing of the conscience, a darkening of the understanding. Okay? Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So you've got ignorance associated with that as well. Right? Ignorance. Yeah. That's what it is. Ignorance. Mm -hmm. Ignorance means ignore, doesn't it? Ignore. So you ignore God's warnings. Ignore the truth. Ignorance. <laughs> so anyway, uh, because of the blindness of their heart. So their heart's blinded. Right? Now I ask a simple question. Who blinded their heart? <laughs> Satan. The God of this world had blinded the minds of them that received not the hope of truth. You see that? So we have this uh, this uh, satanic element involved with it here, whereby uh, once once they go to a certain point, I don't know what it is, but once they go to a certain point, God gives them over to Satan, just turns them loose and says, "Okay." And then, folks, the situation after that is dire. Now, I'm not saying somebody can't get saved. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, people can get themselves in a whole heap mess. <laughs> I mean, bad situation. And it takes a miracle for, for them to get out of that and get saved. And believe me, some Christians do the same exact thing. They become shipwrecked concerning their faith. And don't think this just does apply to, 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 uh, to unsaved people. This applies to Christians too. We can get ourselves in the same mess. And they do. We often do, right? All right, so the eventual consequence of this willful action on the part of the sinner to ignore his conscience because he loves his sin and doesn't want to give it up, is that he begins to call evil good and good evil in order to justify his sin. And so this is an old, old story, folks, right? This happened in the Old Testament, wonder, and particularly the, the children of Israel, right? We know it happened even before Israel even came about, during the time before the flood. The same thing, it happens over and over and over again. It happens nationally, it happens worldwide, and it happens individually, right? And so what happens is the sin gets to a point where the person is so completely confused. I look at the stuff that goes on in this world in this country now, and I'm the, this scripture just boring. It just glares at me. They get to the point where they're so confused that they're so blinded, they don't know right from wrong and have no uh, uh, moral authority but their own hearts, their own defiled hearts. They get to the point where they say, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Folks, if that doesn't describe this, this country right now, I don't know what does. And it's gotten worse in just the last 10 years. I've noticed it. Yes, sir. You know, all this... Faith, 
Okay, so we can now understand that seemingly uh, perplexity in regards to the thinking of reprobate sinners, because of their sins, they have lost their ability of natural discernment, which is governed by a God-given conscience. So once once that conscience is seared by sin, okay, and they start, they get to the point where they cannot discern right from wrong, okay, then they they lose their ability of natural discernment, okay. And then what they'll do, especially the academics of our current time, they'll go and default to the books that they've read and the things that they've studied and man's wisdom. And that's what they default to. Instead of defaulting to what the truth of God's word is, they default to science or they default to psychology or, so, or something like that. And so when they make decisions on the court, if they're in the higher echelons of the court or if they're in government elected officials, they start defaulting, not to what God says, but defaulting to their education, right? And they've lost their ability to discern right from what, right from wrong. And so we as Christians sitting there thinking, how could that person think that that's the right thing to do? Well, you gotta keep in mind, they're blinded. They literally have lost their ability. Their conscience has been so seared and they have lost their ability to discern truth from, uh, from error. They can't discern it. And so what do they default to? They default to their own minds, right? Or they default to science or whatever. That's, ha that's, that's what happened, okay? Okay, and so um, they then developed something called situation, situation ethics. How many of y'all heard of situation ethics? Situation ethics, right? <laughs> the situation calls for it, then it's perfectly fine to do it. Just depends on your situation, right? That's, that's the way they think. Another good term you're going to hear of the liberals uh, say and some Christians unfortunately well the end justifies the means so do, you you disobey God's word but if it turns out something good for God in the end then it's okay eh, wrong answer <laughs> it don't work that way <laughs> but that's the way they think you see they think that way right the end justifies the means as long as we get to the same goal you know who cares if you have to murder somebody you know the situation calls for it, yeah, go ahead. You see, that's the way they think, all right? And so uh, they, they can then develop called something called situation ethics to compensate for the spiritual blindness. They have to compensate because everybody's gonna be faced with moral dilemmas in life. They have to deal with it. There's no way around it. So a born again Christian that loves the word of God is gonna go straight to the book and say, what does the Lord say? But a person who's been blinded and whose conscience is seared with a hot iron, what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna, they're gonna go to their own self-reasoning, their own contaminated minds, or they're gonna go to other men with the distorted reasoning, contaminated mind. See that? But they have to default to something. They have to go somewhere. And so by this, by doing this, they do things that are completely contrary to what we would call common sense and common decency. For instance, the reprobate sinner loves to fornicate, so he teaches school children to do the same. The consequence is unwanted pregnancies. So instead of acknowledging it as a consequence of disobedience to God and repenting, he decides to get rid of the consequence by burning the child in the womb. You know what that's what abortion is all about? You know what it is? Now, I know it's got a spiritual component to it. I believe it's satanic sacrifice. I believe that. But it also has a physical, uh, worldly uh, dealing with it. Okay? And so what they say is, well, it's an unwanted pregnancy. It's unwanted. You see what I mean? What happened was the person disobeyed God, had relations outside of wedlock, they wound up pregnant, and then now they have faced with a situation that is life-changing. And so what's the government's solution? Well, we've got abortion clinics. Just go ahead and kill the it. <laughs> you know, it's an it. It's a fetus, it. You see, it's not a human being. Just go ahead and kill it and then your life's gonna be fine. Then you can have a baby when you get ready to have one. See, instead of saying abstinence, 
until you get married, a monogamous relationship with one woman your entire life, one man your entire life. And so that's the problem you see there. This is just one example, but it gets a lot more detail than this. All right. Uh, a sin blinds them to the natural ability to know what is right and what is wrong. Okay, so we read that in Isaiah 520. They no longer have an absolute authority, and without an absolute authority, they cannot have absolute truth. And we went through this in, on one of our studies a while back, talking about absolute authority and absolute truth. That's what this King James Bible issue and this new Bible issue is all about. It's about who's in authority? Who's in authority? Am I going to be the judge and authority of which one is right and which one is wrong? Or is it God going to be the authority? That's, that's what it's about. And what is truth? That's what Pilate told Jesus and walked out. What is truth? Right? Well, if you don't have an absolute authority, then you have no way to judge absolute truth. And you don't have absolute truth. If you don't have absolute truth, then basically you can do whatever you want to do. Because I have my own personal truth, and he has his own personal truth, she has her own, her own personal truth, and it all depends on the situation I'm in, whether it's a truth or whether it's a lie. Total chaos. Total chaos and confusion. Confusion. All right, so Christians have gotten themselves into the same mess. They are told to read the Bible of your choice, and with that, they become the absolute authority to determine what is truth and what is error. None of the Bibles all agree on a given verse, so they are told to pick the one that sounds right for you. The end result of this are predictable confusion and apostasy. So what happens is the person does not have an absolute truth, does not have an absolute authority, and then they default to their own reasoning or they default to quote-unquote scholarship, people that are supposedly smarter than them and spend their lives studying and all this and that. Say, well, so-and-so says this, and he's got all the letters around his name, and what about the Holy Spirit? Hey, man, what about the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, right? What about prayer? What about fasting over this issue? So we've got 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion. He is. Who's the author of confusion? Satan, right? And so those that be out there would say, well, you're just being divisive. You're dividing the church. You're saying things that are divisive and causing the brethren to hate each other. No, it's not got nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, it's what it's got to do with is absolute authority. That's what it's got to do with. Am I going to be the authority or am I going to let Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, go to me to be the authority? See what I mean? All right. So another example is the homosexual disease of AIDS, which originally was called GRID. Tell me what GRID means. Now, this was back in the 70s when it first came out. I remember this. It's called gay related immune deficiency. Oh, they changed that quick. That didn't work out too well. And so what they call it now is AIDS, autoimmune deficiency, right? And so with any communicable disease, quarantine is the first step in containment to prevent the disease, the spread of disease to others. But this common sense action was completely ignored in this case. And I remember when this happened, people were all up in arms about it, saying if someone's got something that's got a disease that's going to kill you, they need to be quarantined. But AIDS became a political issue. They politicized it, just like you're doing this so-called COVID thing right now. They're politicizing it. And guess where that homosexual agenda is now? Folks, it came out like, like fire now. After this AIDS thing went over, blow over. It didn't blow over, but you know what I mean. It's kind of just ignited it. And so to that point now, look at where we're at. The situation is absolutely dire. So... So it was, uh, it was called GRID. With any communicable disease, uh, go into uh, uh, quarantine. Instead of acknowledging GRID as a consequence of sin of homosexuality, because in the beginning, only practicing homosexuals contracted it and spread it. That's why they called it that. The scientists themselves, medical personnel, called it that because it was in that community in, in, uh, in uh, San Francisco that this thing started, right? And they called it that for a reason, because that's where the disease was at. And then, as, and then as a consequence, and then became only uh, practicing homosexual conduct. Kind of the reprobates that love that filthy sin renamed the disease to AIDS and then allowed it to contaminate heterosexuals through blood transfusion. So then 
that they had that situation. Once they didn't quarantine, then it crossed that barrier, or you know, it wasn't a barrier, but they crossed over into the heterosexual population. And it happened through blood transfusion, but it also happened through the uh, prostitution situation, whereby heterosexuals had uh, that were uh, engaged with the bisexual community, they actually contacted too. So instead of quarantining the ones that were that had the, the disease, they just politicized it, and it things spread everywhere. So they got had themselves a real mess. They weren't gonna they weren't gonna admit that the, the, that 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 it was because of sin, All right? And so. So in the mind of a reprobate sinner, because he is no more absolute, we're about to judge right and wrong, he is his own God. He then thinks that it is perfectly fine to lie, cheat, murder, steal, rape, torture, as long as the end justifies the means or the situation calls for it. This is called situation ethics. Truth and morality are relative to the situation. There are no absolutes. And let me tell you folks, if we're on this earth and they start persecuting the church, this is going to apply. It's going to apply to me. It's going to apply to you. It's going to apply to every Christian there. Right? We are going to become the enemy of the state. And by any means necessary, we have to be quelched. We cannot be speaking the truth out of the world. So if God lets it happen, this whole situation, persecution of the church, is going to be run by people who believe in situation ethics. All right? So, um, so, um, there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute authority. Man is his own final authority. When his own wicked, depraved nature is his own <laughs> guide, he cannot help but damn himself. And that's what happens. God lets him damn himself. He takes his hand off, he stops trying to stop him, he stops trying to get in the way and, and, and keep him from running off the cliff, and he just backs up and they damn themselves. They damn themselves. They do it, right? So they justified to themselves the contamination of the heterosexual community with AIDS and then spent millions of taxpayer dollars on finding a cure instead of acknowledging God's judgment on sin of sexual perversion and seeking repentance. That's your America, folks. All right. So let's take a look at as hard as to seek for above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. <laughs> and he said, he said, he said that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. That's what defiles the man. For within and out of the heart of men proceed evil faults, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these, these evil things come from within and defile the man. So the, the man is defiled by his own heart. Right? So the sin is already there. Fallen man. It's already there. All these things are within every human being that's born. I don't care how good, godly, dedicated they are. I don't care if they spend the whole life studying the Greek and the Hebrew and, and, and crawl on, the, on broken glass on their knees. I don't care. This is what is in man. And there's only one way to overcome this. And what is that? A new birth. A new birth. You've got to have a new birth. All right? And so the ravages of sin. You've seen this chart already. All right, so, but not only will sin destroy a man's mind, his conscience, and his soul, but it will destroy his body. The detrimental effects of sin on the physical body is evident every day as we look around us. Unbridled sin will drive a man to madness. We talked about that last week, okay? It, it'll take your mind away from you, all right? All right, as well as have deleterious effects on the physical frame. You smoke, you get cancer. You drink, you get liver damage. You habitually fornicate, you get AIDS. Folks, you know, there are consequences. You guys know this. I'm preaching the choir. I'm telling people when you see it, right? There are consequences. And there are weeping and sowing. Whether it be good deeds or bad deeds, whether it be sin or righteousness, they're going to reap. Okay? And there's going to be fruit. It's going to be evil fruit. It's going to be good fruit. Right? And so it is by this principle that we can know that the majority of the suffering in this life is the result of sin. Amen. Amen. If you look at a sinner's life, you will see that the majority of the suffering is self-inflicted. And folks, a lot of people, they finally come to the end of themselves. They finally come to the end of themselves and they realize, I did this to me. I can't blame anybody else. It's not their fault. It's not her fault. It's my fault. I did it. And when they come to that point, a lot of times God can deal with them. They can, he, can get them he can get them where he can deal with them. And a lot of them get saved when they get to that point. Right? All right, so... 
We can see confirmation of this in Scripture. John 5, 5. And a certain man was there, which had confirmed me 38 years. 38 years. Man, almost 40 years he was in this condition. Now look what Jesus says here. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. You know what that tells me? His situation was a result of something he did early on. Now, I'm not saying everything is like that. I'm not saying that just because you get cancer means you smoke all your life. I'm not saying that. But a lot of times, a lot of times, the things like this that happen, if we dig in our past, we can find where it started. And sin has consequences, physical consequences, right? So, uh, Proverbs 5.11, And thou mourneth the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Instructed me. One of the things that I thought was interesting, I went to the eye doctor a while back, and uh, she and I were having a conversation there, and just talking, and, and she said, You know, I've been doing the uh, uh, charity work, going over to the... Um, to the uh, home, the uh, uh, convalescent home here. And one of the things that I've noticed lately is a lot of these people that are in the convalescent home are in their 40s and 50s. And she said, you know what it is? They wrap their bodies out with drug, drug abuse. Isn't that something? 50, year, 50 years old, and you're totally incapacitated because of drug abuse. I can count right now five people that I know just recently that have died, died from overdoses. And so sin has consequences on the physical frame. All right, so uh, Isaiah 50, 11. Behold, all ye that kindle the fire, that can pass yourself about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. Lie down in sorrow. I got a friend at work, and uh, her husband, um, he was at the back of for years and years and years. Many years. All his life, actually. And uh, started having problems with his job. He went in there to the doctor and said, you got bone cancer in the jaw. And they had to take a whole section of that jaw out and put something fake in there and all to get it. It doesn't mean it's over with. But what I'm saying is, is... Oftentimes, the troubles that we have in this life are self-inflicted because of disobedience to God's word. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. So, let's look at uh, uh, idols of the heart. That they may all be damned. And then we'll close it out here. Ezekiel 14. Let's go to Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14. Okay. And I'm going to read 1 through 11 here. Okay. All right. Verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. That's not good. <laughs> All right, verse 5. That I might take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. 
Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth as Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up the idols in his heart, and putteth the stone of the rock of iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. Verse 8. And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 9. And if that prophet be deceived, when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of the people of Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions. But that they may be my people, and I will be their God, saith the Lord. And you see that those verses there. Pay particular attention to verse 9. And if the prophet be deceived, I have deceived that prophet. So that's what we got going on right now in America. We got a country that doesn't want to give it up. They don't want to give up what God said is sin. God points at it. He says, you got to give it up. You got to give it up. Be holy for I am holy. And they say, Lord, I can't give it up. I love it too much. I can't give it up. It doesn't matter what it is. Pornography. Drunkenness idolatry, covetousness, just name it all. Folks, the church is full of it. I'm guilty of all kinds of stuff. Even in my thought life, I'm guilty of it. And I have to repent. I have to turn to God and do it. But a lot of Christians, a lot of people in this country will not do it. Right? And so what does God say? He said, I will be your delusion. I will deceive you. Right? God is not mocked. He is not mocked. Some men count slackness, but God does not count slackness. He means what he says. Now, he's long-suffering and merciful. Amen to that. Thank God for that. By all means, I should be dead or in prison right now, but God have mercy on me, all right? And so the thing is, I'm glad he's long-suffering, but there comes a point. There comes a point when this country has gone too far, and it's going to be Katie Barbara Dorn. We're done. All right? So Ezekiel 14, 3, and it says right there, the stumbling block of iniquity before their face. And put the stumbling block of iniquity before their face. You see that? It's something that the man is doing to himself. The sinner does it to himself. The suffering that is a consequence of this idolatry is self-inflicted. Right? I, the Lord, will answer him uh, according to the multitude of his idols. Okay? So Mark 4, 11 says it. He said, and you kind of wonder about this passage, you know. Why would Jesus Christ say that God blinded the minds of these people? Now we understand why, you see. We look at uh, Mark 4, 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them, talking about those that are without, Pharisees and all that. All these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. You're thinking, well, who can resist the will of God? And it, you know, God has, quote unquote, preordained them to damnation. No, he hasn't. You didn't get the whole story. The whole story is they rejected God's truth early on. They rejected God's truth. They rejected John the Baptist. They rejected Christ. And you know what he said? Okay. Uh oh. Have at it, Satan. Blind the dives. And God lets them damn themselves. And that's just what they did. Alright? So, 2 uh, Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. See that? There's where it starts. That's where it starts. Rejection of absolute truth and absolute authority. That's where it starts. The downward spiral starts right there. Okay? That they might be saved. And for this cause, look at look, God shall send them strong delusion. Mm -hmm. That they should believe a lie. And that they might all be damned. 
who believe not the truth, but have only you know righteousness. There it is. All right. So the reason for this is given in this seemingly unfair statement in Mark four twelve is that when a man rejects the light of truth when God gives it to him and loves unrighteousness rather than loving the truth or God, then God gives that man over to a deceived heart so that he will damn himself. The principle set forth here is that the word of God is a two-edged sword by which if a man's heart motive is wrong, it will destroy him. That is, God will answer him according to the sin in his heart and further deceive him unto his own damnation. This is one of the chief characteristics of the last days and it's stated in 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay? All right? And then you've got these, these uh, all these scriptures here. I'm not going to go through all of them. You could look them back up on your own time there. But particularly pay attention to Pharaoh. When God said he hardened Pharaoh's heart, a lot of people say, well, that's not fair either. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. How can Pharaoh resist God? Well, the problem was Pharaoh rejected the truth in the beginning, and then God gave him his rightful judgment. Right? All right? It is God who will send the false prophets among them. All right? And so we talk about all that. You see that in 2 Peter uh, 2 1 there. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of the home. Uh, of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You see that? Truth is cast in the streets. You got your own truth. I got my own truth. See, we don't have any absolute truth, right? That's the way they're thinking. Their minds is, 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 is contaminated, and then it says right here, many shall follow the pernicious ways of the false prophets that will arise, okay? And so uh, 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 this, is, this is where America is now. It's Christian leadership that has been given over to spiritual blindness because they have rejected God's words. W-O-R-D-S. Hebrews 10 31. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of living God. And of course we have here, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man or a nation soweth, that shall he also reap. Right now we're reaping, folks. We're reaping. That's what we're doing. And I pray we get out of here before it gets worse. God will send spiritual blindness and famine of the word of God. Let's go to Isaiah 6. We've still got five minutes left. Let's go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And we'll wrap this up. Isaiah 6, 8. Isaiah 6, 8. And this is Isaiah... And one of the things you get here in the very first three, four verses is the absolute holiness of God. You read that in your own time and you just kind of get an awe of God Almighty sitting on his throne in perfect righteousness, dealing with sinful man that will not obey him. Now, let's go on to verse six. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs, from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Verse 9, And he said, Go, tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, Make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he goes on and talks there, talks about how the, the end days are going to be. All right, go to the end tribulation period. So you see there, right there, it's talking how God just puts the blinders on them. They they committed idolatry. They 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 continue to cast God's words behind their back. Over and over and over, God's hand is stretched out still. He's saying, just come unto me, just hear me, just listen to me, just obey what I'm telling you, or just please do it. And pleading with them over and over and over. They murdered the prophets. They made their idols. They went in league with the people of the land, worshiped their gods. And God said, okay. Blindness descended upon them. And guess what? They're so blinded that they crucified their own Messiah when he came the first time. And they're so blinded, they're still blinded today. 
And the only way that veil of blindness will be lifted off of Israel right now is if one of them comes to Jesus Christ as a Savior, as a Savior, individually, but not as a nation. Not as a nation. Okay? And so we got up here talking here. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment and part. I see that. Amos 8 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but for the hearing of the words of the Lord. And I know this talking about Israel, but folks, you're looking at America right now. There's going to be a famine in the Word of God in this country. There's already a famine of doctrine. Folks, you get stuff in here that, that some seminary students don't even know. You know, it's real. I mean, I've read their books. Folks, and the thing is, this kind of doctrine is not taught. You can turn on the TV or listen to the radio. You don't hear this stuff that often. So the stuff you're getting in here. So doctrine is, is a famine for doctrine, for the word of God. All right? It says John 12, 40. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. See that? Romans 11, 8. According to it is written, God hath given them a spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see and ears that should not hear. Isaiah 29, 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do marvelous works among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish. For I will work a work in your days, and you would no eyes believe it. And so they wonder and they perish, right? Okay? I don't have time to read Hosea 14, but I would highly recommend reading that tonight before you go to bed. Just, just read that little short chapter, short chapter. And tell me if you don't see America written right in the pages of Hosea 14. It's, I mean, it just jumps out at me. Y'all kind of let me know what you think, all right? All right, so this principle of God damning the sinner further is a reason that people who didn't get saved during the church age won't get saved after the rapture of the church. Now, I know there's also people out there, preachers out there talking, saying, well, you know, a lot of people are going to get saved during the tribulation period. Yeah, there is. There's going to be a major revival. But the people, I'm, I just look at the scriptures, and I'm thinking, the people that have the chance for gospel right now, that know the truth and reject it, and keep putting off salvation, and putting it off, and putting it off. When that rapture happens, I don't think you're going to make it. I got too many scriptures to tell me that they're not going to get saved when they see that. There's going to be a strong delusion over the world where they're going to believe a lie. And this principle of God letting them damn themselves is going to happen to those people that do not receive Christ now, and they stay on this earth after the rapture. I don't see it. I don't see them getting saved. Right? Okay. And so, we got these scriptures here. Y'all pretty much know those. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, rebellion is the fruit of a, uh, I mean, a, sin is a, is a is fruit of a rebellious heart. And so, what we, what we want to do is pray for the country, pray for each other, and seek God to show us the way every day away from the carnality in, in, in that we find ourselves immersed in. It's really bad. It's really bad. And we're kind of sheltered here in this little town. Look, I mean, you go into big cities and it gets, it gets rough. Okay. And so let's pray for each other. Keep each other lifted up. Keep each other giving account to each other. And I don't think we've got much time. We want to be right. Do what God told us to do when he calls us home. So this is an open forum, and you guys can teach me just as much as I can teach you. I want to hear what your opinions are and all that. So uh, I'm going to say a prayer to dismiss, and we'll be 